Welcome to week one of Internet Marketing, the pre-recorded lecture series. We're going to run about 14 to 16 of these lectures, and we're going to cover the whole gamut of the Internet Marketing experience. We're going to do it in a couple of slices. The first three weeks are going to cover some of the frameworks, theories and ideas that are very useful for deciding what you're going to do with an e-marketing platform. We're going to follow that by going straight into the marketing mix and getting into the value offer, price, promotion and distribution before we take the break, well, we take the absence of classes around the end of week six, come back in week seven and we're into the application section. Now, week 7 to 11, we're going to be looking at a lot more case studies and a lot more applications of the theory. The theory that we're going to teach you in weeks 1 to 6. So let's look at a couple of other things before we kick this into gear. You have four assessment tasks. Details are on the Waddle site with your own explainer videos. But a key thing to understand is that the reason we've created these on-demand lecture series is to provide you with knowledge, content, and a little bit of skills practice to help you. Now, some of the stuff I'm going to talk about in the first four weeks is going to connect into the e-technology analysis, obviously. But equally, it's going to plug into class participation. It's going to be theories that will explain what happens to create online engagement. It'll be frameworks that you can use for self-analysis to chip into the ePortfolio. And because it's about strategy, metrics, and tactics, it will feed over into the performance review as well as the technology analysis. So functionally, the idea here is that I'm going to talk. I'm going to tell you about the theory. I'm going to tell you about some applications of the theory, how I see it put together, and why this particular idea is useful for you as an e-marketer in practice, an e-marketer in training. And I'm going to emphasize a couple of areas, the idea of the work integrated learning. So what I talk about in terms of theories that you can use in a workplace, so you can use in a life project. And also I'm going to talk about the idea of life integrated learning. When we start to pull down theories that describe ourselves, when we start to look at frameworks that explain how we engage with the internet and how we act and react to content online. Together, this should give you a nice robust set of ideas to run with over the semester, talk about in the live events, talk about on the forums, and inform decisions that you make, both with regards to your assessment tasks, but also for getting out there with your self-service internship of running your own internet presence. For the technology analysis sets you up to do stuff, to run a platform, to operate an account, to create stuff. And what we're going to talk about is the strategies, tactics, and decisions that underpin doing that well in real life on the internet. We're going to start with a little recap of marketing. A key thing in the recap of marketing is that we want you to have one of two experiences. We either want this to be a confirmation of things you already know, in which case, awesome, you have previously learnt stuff. Or we want this to be a discovery process of things you didn't know, and congratulations, you're about to learn stuff. So. Let's kick in and have a look. Now, the first thing that you want to be aware of is there are two definitions of marketing. The American Marketing Association definition. Uh, now, on screen, it's listed as 2017. You may also see the same definition cited as 2007 and 2013. This is because the definition changed in 2007 and was reaffirmed in 2013, reaffirmed again in 2017, and probably due to get reaffirmed at some point this semester. So if all goes well, it will be AMA 2021 and the same words. Key thing to understand for definition is that this is a tactical definition. Its emphasis is around creation, communication, delivery, and exchange of offerings that have value. 
And that little phrase, offerings that have value, is absolutely central to how we're going to conceptualize what we do with the internet and what we do with those projects we create for the ETA. Also, this definition does bring in a whole gamut of other elements, so it's worth looking at the linked materials and the assigned reading. But specifically, have in mind the idea that marketing isn't just us as the marketer and them as the customer. It's now about more stakeholders and society. So we have a broader application of marketing than we did prior to 2007. The strategic definition of marketing is the Charges Institute, the British Academy's view of marketing. And this comes with a nice little mantra that I like here of identify, anticipate, and satisfy customer requirements. I see this as a strategic because they talk about it as a management process, but also it has this little hook of do these things profitably. And the notion of profitability in here is also tied into the idea that marketing should have a return on effort and marketing should have a return on investment. So these two frameworks are operative throughout the course and you're invited to use the one that best fits your style. If you're about the close quarters tactical stuff, create, communicate, deliver and exchange, or are you about the one step back, the helicopter view of identify, anticipate and satisfy? Pick yours, work with it, embrace it, embed it. But functionally, for me, the central idea that you are going to come back to repeatedly across this course is that marketing is about the offering that has value. And value is something that is codependent on your customer and is co-created with your customer. So we're going to start with a position of, instead of thinking about product, instead of thinking about goods or services or ideas, we're going to think about an offering that has value. And the nature of that value is subjective to the individual. And we're going to work with that to embed that throughout the course. Along the way, what we're going to do is we're going to use the marketing mix. Now, it's an old friend. It's a familiar favorite. And that is price, product, promotion, place. For us, though, we're going to start with product because product is the broad area in which the offering that has value originates. Now, it's very important to be aware of two other aspects here. First is that there are additional marketing mixes in operation. If you are doing services marketing or you've done services marketing, you will recognize the seven Ps, physical evidence, people, and processes. From an e-marketer's perspective, people and processes are particularly useful, but we're not emphasizing the services marketing content in this operation. We're going to really drive out of that first four Ps. Also, though, what we are interested in doing is that we're going to recognize the four Ps of marketing are a marketer side intervention. These four aspects are what we control and we have a new asset. We have the SIVA marketing mix. Solution, information, value, and access. And this is a consumer side view of the value offer. SIVA will recur at multiple points throughout the semester and there's an attached reading on Wattle. But the short version is, this is a marketing mix that asks, does the value offer solve the customer's problem? but also ask it from the customer's perspective of, does this solve my problem? Does this create a solution or an offering that has value? The information aspect is about how do I learn about that solution as a holistic idea, not just how do I hear about the brand, but how do I learn how to use the product? How do I learn to get the most value out of my value offer? What does the brand, the distribution channel, the price, 
the quality of the product, what does that communicate to me as a message about this solution? Value is about the total ideal of what do I have to forego, what do I have to sacrifice, forego or exchange in order to get to that offering that has value. Now, access is a combination of distribution, can I get to the offering that has value? Once I do, do I have the resources, skills and abilities to co-create the most effective solution that I can? Because quite often accessibility issues mean that there is a product and that product is not an offering that has value because it can't be accessed. If you can't get the benefit that is on offer from the product, it's not an offering that has value and it's not a solution. So the SIVA model is going to recur at points to help us look back and say, are we creating something that is valued by our audience? All right, let's uh, recap a little theory. Some of these should be familiar. Some of them might be new. All of them are being raised here so that when you encounter them in practice and application a little bit later in semester, they're familiar. All right, the first one I want to talk about is an old school theory back from the 90s. This is the concept of relationship marketing, of which there is a wide range of material. Key to me are these three ideas. The fundamental principle of relationship marketing is that we move from a one-off, one-shot transaction through to a longer, ongoing, mutual exchange of benefit. To do that, there are three elements required. And those elements are trust, commitment, and reciprocity. When you have trust, you can engage in behaviors that may be immediately detrimental to you in the belief that they will be of benefit and positive in the longer term because you're not going to be taken advantage of by the trading partner. Commitment is also the idea that it's not just about the here and now, but it's about the longer term. So it makes some upfront sacrifices valuable because there's a longer term payoff to be expected. And reciprocity is the idea that the exchange doesn't always have to be equal to be mutually beneficial. That one party may put more into the exchange, but that both parties can see that they are benefiting from it and therefore it's a successful relationship. The second area of theory that's going to come in handy for you is to borrow anything that's not nailed down from services marketing. If you've studied services marketing, ACE, you'll be able to bring a lot of the theoretical frameworks and a lot of the stuff you trained on across into e-marketing. If you haven't, then I'm going to be introducing you to a couple of concepts that you may encounter a little bit later uh, in that course. Top of the list though, there's the idea of the internet as a service because the internet is intangible. It's also inconsistent and inseparable and very hard to stockpile, uh, even though inventory is probably the one that's closest to being a reality. What you want to do with these ideas is think about the fact that everything you're going to be doing involving an online presence and online practice is going to be bounded by some of the frameworks that are explained in the services marketing literature. So you've got this entire array of assets at your disposal if you want to look up additional ways to explain what your process plan or attack pattern will be during your ETA. The other theories that are of use here is the zone of tolerance, aka the gap model. The zone of tolerance is very useful for both e-marketing practice and this subject. See, one of the things about education, particularly the way that we're doing e-marketing this semester, by making a full digital delivery course, I am pushing it far further into the intangible, inseparable, you've got to be at the live event to be able to participate in the live event, yet at the same time, 
all these pre-recorded materials and the assets that are on the Waddle site mean that there's an inventory so you can do it at your own timetable. I am a services marketer by training and I have used those theories and frameworks to build my course. Equally, you are going to experience the zone of tolerance in terms of your expectations you bring to the subject, your expectations you bring to each element of the marketing experience, then how well that experience matches what you were expecting versus what you've perceived. What this means in a practical sense is that the three possible areas of experience you can have in any given scenario. You can have an experience that is adequate. And I like to say that adequate is a really good experience. I know, I know. But the concept of the adequate experience, the satisfaction, the I'm happy with that, that was now there's neither dissatisfaction nor is there extreme delight. It's just met expectations and that is what you want. So you'll encounter this across the course. It may be in an assessment item, it may be in a life learning event, it may be in the use of some of our case materials where I send you off during a live event to go play with a bit of the internet. The zone of tolerance is going to impact on you. And this is a way for you to be able to unpack that experience and look at what, if you are satisfied, what was within the zone of tolerance, what were you expecting, how close was it? If you are dissatisfied, what was the variance, what were you expecting that didn't happen? And if you're delighted, what happened that you weren't expecting? So the zone of tolerance will come into hand when we're looking at things like the e-portfolio, when we're looking at assessing our, doing self-evaluations of how was my semester, how was the subject. It will also be useful for setting up elements around the e-performance review and just generally as you're going through the course, thinking about what are your expectations are, what do you want to achieve this week, do you get delight, adequate or unacceptable? It's also worth noting that one of the things about the zone of tolerance is that it moves. It is a shifting target. So you may find yourself completely delighted one week and thoroughly dissatisfied the following because you moved the expectation. It's like, that was amazing. It will always be this good. Next week, yeah. Well, that was adequately adequate. I'm disappointed. The key is it's a subjective set of judgment. Now, your other, your next go-to block. Segmentation, targeting and positioning is the central platform upon which I have built a lot of our experience for this semester. Not least of which is I've used market segmentation to design the course. I'm engaging in active targeting and positioning through the production of these videos and the content I've created. And I'm going to expect you as trainee marketers doing an e-marketing course to use this theory and use the practice that this theory describes. So fundamentally, the idea of segmentation is that you take a given audience and you break it up into smaller subsections that you expect to react in largely the same way. Case in point, this subject is a sub-audience of people doing the Bachelor of Commerce. Within this sub-audience, I've subdivided it into three categories. People who want to go to a daytime class, people who want to go to a nighttime class, and people who don't want to go to a class. So I expect that behavioral segment to be a very good determinant of whether you're going to come along to a Monday after Monday night class, whether you're going to go to the Tuesday class, or whether I don't see you on screen at all and you just do the self-service option. There will be different responses for each member of those segments. The next thing is, segmentation is also then about creating smaller groups so you can get specific. Again, by creating a segment of the course that is described as the Shadow Hawkers, the self-service learning group, 
I am able to target specific messages to them with the knowledge that they won't have attended the live learning event. Therefore, they need a message that's different from the live learning event people who got to hear it in real time. They have their own branding. So do the day, stalker, day walkers and the night stalkers. We have customized products. We have a live event and we have a choose your own adventure style narrator tells you what to do, you do it, pre-recorded series of activities, all based on knowing that there are different needs for the different segments. Following this through, one of the things you want to do with your segmentation is, in terms of a theory, this is a self-explanatory, as in, it explains the self. At various points, I'm going to ask you to describe yourself as, your, as an audience, as a market segment. And what you want to be able to do is get specific quickly. You want to be able to have a narrow audience that you can use, that you can identify, and that you can make modifications to your value offer so it's more valuable to them. The other thing here is that we're going to talk briefly about a couple of the ways in which you could describe yourself or you could describe an audience. One of those is around usage patterns. So how frequently do you use the internet? Do you only go online to go to class? Are you online all the time and occasionally class happens whilst you're there? Are you very familiar with the internet? Is it something that's just been part of your daily practice for a long since you can remember, or are you relatively inexperienced in that you, you have it, but you don't really use it, you don't really get why people would. I mean, there's the outside and everything. All of these behavioral elements of usage patterns and internet experience are ways in which you can think about yourself as an audience, what expertise do you bring to the table, but also the kind of audience that you're trying to target when you create your products, when you create your value offers through the ETA and the subsequent project. The second kind of category here, now this is one I think is very useful for thinking about your own experience with this course forthcoming, is familiarity with the value. How familiar are you with marketing? Like, is this a second, third, is it a capstone course? Where is your expertise with marketing in this respect? What prior knowledge do you bring to the party? And what will that do in terms of how you present yourself, your knowledge and your expertise in the live learning events and then the forums and the participation and engagement? Similarly to familiar with value offer, which can also be around things like, are you big on TikTok or do you not really understand what TikTok is? I uh, do you have a technical familiarity? Do you have a an area of the internet that you are very proficient with or an area of the internet where you're like, I know it's there, but I just don't know what to do with it? So these ideas, this sort of splitting up of the audience, going beyond the basic demography, the basic age, gender, income, going into things like behavioral and experiential, these are elements that we're going to push into as we go through the semester, but worth starting at as that self-analysis of who am I as a market segment? Now, part of this as well is to go create a scenario where you can do a really good audience match. You can think, what is it I want to offer and who is it I would like to be receiving my value offer? When you start picking target markets, you're also picking audiences of people that you want to have engage with you. Think about the kind of, if you want to be a YouTube celebrity, what's the kind of fan you want in your fan base? What's the kind of person that you want to see walking around wearing your merch that you'd be proud to see? That's where you start thinking about your audience match and your audience fit. But we also bring in a couple of the frameworks. We're going to deal with these various points throughout the semester. Similarly, audience market fit is going to come back inside strategy because what we're trying to really get you to think about is what is it I want to offer? What is the audience I want to offer it to? 
how well do we mesh up? How well do we interact? What could we, what can I tweak to make it a better fit? But also, what's fundamental? What am I not changing? Because that's not something that I, that's not negotiable. That's a, a part of what I want to present. Now, once you've collected your, worked out your various markets and your various segments, and remember, segment is plural in this sense, I'm going to ask you, for the purposes of this semester, to work with a primary market segment. The reason I'm asking you to do this is to make your semester manageable. This is about making it easier for you, not harder. The initial decision is going to be complex, difficult, and probably a little painful because they should, market segmentation should ask of you to make a decision and a decision that has a consequence and you should then need to act on that consequence. But fundamentally, when you create your ETA and you start talking about the project you want to run, I want you thinking about who is the first audience you want to address that value offer to. Then you can start thinking about how am I going to do that with a real focus, a real understanding of who is it you want on the other side of the screen looking at your content. Now, for me, for this semester, my recommendation is think about your return on effort as your return on investment. It can be return on emotion or return on effort. What do you want to do that matches up and do you really want to do this for 12 weeks? Yeah. Don't make something you think would impress me if you would hate to deliver it. Make something you would love to deliver and that's going to impress me. I've mentioned this a couple of times and I'm going to mention it again. When you've got a market selected, it should change your marketing mix. The Shadow Hawker self-service team has a different product offer and a different set of products than the live learning team. They got to be my primary audience because I could pre-record material before the live events. So the shadow hawkers were market number one, the live learners were market number two. Consequently, I created a product where I distributed in a different fashion to what I'm going to distribute for the live learners. The material I'm currently pre-recording is being recorded before semester has commenced. So this element is about prioritization. Who gets the first of my efforts? Not who's more important, who do I love more and love least, who's my favorite cohort. It's I have a production schedule. Which group can I best produce material for? I can use my pre-semester to create content that content can be pre-recorded, therefore I should focus on my pre-recorded team first, so I create the content for them in advance, freeing up my time for the live learners when we get into the real-time semester. So, to recap, for this subject, we are using market segmentation. ET is not just a theory, it is the practice. A primary segment has been created. Those who will attend live events, those who won't. For those, for the live learners, a seminar workshop has been created. It will be delivered in real time on a Monday and a Tuesday. A pre-recorded product has been created. It will be released on a Wednesday. We therefore have modified our distribution, our product, and probably even our price. But definitely our distribution and our product were changed because one segment was different from the other on a core variable. And said, so targeting is just a case of who do you want to work with first? Not any other reason, any other rationale, it's which is the audience that will get your attention first, who will get it second, who will get it third. In your ETA and your practice of your marketing project, the reason I'm asking you to pick a primary audience is just to make it easier. Your ETA has a very short word count and semester rolls really fast. So if you're trying to produce a multifaceted, multi-product, multi-value offer project, whilst you're doing three other subjects and working, it's going to be rough.
give yourself a give yourself a break. Cut yourself some slack. Make it targeted. Also, bluntly, as we said, it's got to modify your marketing mix. You've got to have an implement. It also should inform. It should be a once you've got your segment, that segment's characteristics, its traits, its nature, where you find it, what it wants, that should make life easier for you and beneficial for you, just how and why you tailored the offer. All right, going to bring in the last part of the segmentation, targeting, positioning. Positioning is a relative conceptual idea. Uh, it will show up again in strategy because it's really helpful. Positioning is what the consumer assumes the market place. Uh, it comes from putting things on shelves in supermarkets. Really go into a supermarket, pick a brand, look that way, look that way, look up, look down. What is literally positioned in the real space around the brand, those are brands of similar competitive nature. And that's what it is here in the conceptual level is you can either think of it as a, it's like X for Y. So describing the old uh, classic movie Alien as Jaws on a spaceship. Or you can describe it as, uh, we're cheaper than, cheaper than Optus, but more expensive than Telstra. And if you're positioning that, it's going, hang on, that's possible. You can start working out where are you in things like pricing. Are you above the market? Do you match the market? Are you below the market? Who is your competitor? Are you more expensive, less expensive, the same expense as them? Positioning is really useful for a lot of marketing mix decisions. It also is going to be something that you don't get to set, you get to discover. It's not done by objective criteria, it's a subjective idea. Also, Think about this subject. Where does this subject fit compared to other subjects? Where do you fit into the subject compared to other students? It's a really useful thing. Uh, again, it's going to recur at various points, but it's also helpful for getting a sense of the existence of a competitor is a good thing, not a bad thing, because if a competitor is in a market, you can position like or unlike what they're doing. All right, let's get into one of the big topic areas, value. This is going to influence a lot of what we do this semester. So first of all, value here is in the marketing language. There are many other definitions of the word value. Functionally for me, what is of interest here is the idea of the offering that has value. Instead of a product, a good made of fixed atoms, a service made of fixed experiences, an idea made of fixed concepts, an offering that has value is the beginning of the relationship. It's the starting point where the consumer can take what I'm putting into the marketplace and make of that and make with that something that solves their problem, meets their need, creates value for them. So this brings up a few other frameworks and a few other theories, but functionally what we're going to focus on this semester is offerings. We don't think about it in terms of a fixed finite, we think about it as a flexible, an element we provide to others that they can then act on. So in terms of perceiving value, from a consumer's perspective, it's at its rawest core, did I get more from this experience than it cost me to endure, to acquire, to access? You'll see that the total customer value there is multifaceted. Uh, we are going to come back to this around price and the discussion around value creation there. But for the moment, the big thing to be thinking about is that you have multiple ways in which you can influence the offering that has value. It can be influenced through the perception of what having this object would mean for me. It can be influenced through how the service staff or the sales staff or the people involved helped. 
It can be influenced through the raw component elements. But there's also the cost side, and we're going to bring back this in non-financial price in pricing, and that is there's more than money involved. There's time, energy, and psychic cost. So we're going to pick back up on that a few times during the semester, and particularly when we get into the case studies, we're going to really talk about how that impacts on using different types of or different elements of the internet. So your theoretical framework of choice here, and Starting from week two, we're going to introduce reviews of specific papers, but here we're just going to talk about different theories. Co-creation of value. Vargo and Lush, 2004, introduced the idea of the service-dominant logic, and that brought forward the idea that everything, every product has an embedded service, and that we engage in an act of self-service behavior when we use a product, and therefore we are responsible in part for the creation of any value we get out of it. This allow this mindset, this whole movement from product is fait accompli, we put into market, you buy, to an offering that we extend and then we work together to get you the best outcome of which you have to contribute. This theory also heavily impacts how the course works for you. Co-creation of value is going to enable you or thwart you. That's, that's it. Either it's the kind of thing that you're into and you can go, look at my course, look at all the assets and options and go, yeah, I can make something from that. I'm going to take that project and I'm going to turn it into mine and I'm going to express me through here. Or you're going to look at my course, see all these assets, choices, and opportunities, and go, oh, God, I hate this. Why couldn't it just be a quiz with an exam? Why, why, why all the freedom? <laughs> so, look, again, it's a market segment thing. If, it's, if you're not into co-creation of value and you just want a nice little crispy exam at the end with a bunch of multiple choice questions, find another subject. Don't, don't run with us. It won't work. We're not your... You're not my market. If that's what you need, you're not my market. Now, we've talked about co-creation value. I'm going to talk about a couple of different ways in which value gets created. The first one is fundamental to the co-creation. So this is core to the whole co-creation literature. And this is value comes from the use. Nothing has inherent worth until that worth is activated. Best case study for this, best case example, is always the umbrella at home when it's raining. The umbrella has no value if you're standing in the rain getting wet. So the value comes from the use of the offer, and it comes from creation through use. So that's, round, that's value option number one. For this course, by the way, value and use is about engaging in the seminars. It's about posting on the forums. It's about posting up on Padlet and responding to people on Padlet and the forums. It's about reading the readings. It's about doing the assignment with a, I want to get something out of this assignment, rather than a dumb thing, got to get it done, 1,500 words. Value comes from what you co-create with it. Now, with that in mind, one of the challenges about value and use is picking back up on SIVA. Can the customer get the value out of the offer? This is something I'm aware of in the subject, is if I, I have set a number of scaffolds and structures and training events in place so that you can practice and rehearse the value acquisition skills. I want you to get the best out of these assignments that you can get, and I'm going to train you in the mindset, the thinking, the behaviors, the feelings, the things you need to do so that you can get your value in use. You will need certain skills. I don't assume you have those skills at this point in time because it's not fair to assume that. I'm doing a market segmentation thing here. I'm not assuming the presence of a particular element. I'm providing the opportunity to train. If you are then familiar, you can go, yeah, I got that. 
if you're unfamiliar, you can act on it. So that's the first thing. Can the customer get value out of the offer? Now, this will be a thing for when you're creating your own projects. Will people be able to get value from what you're doing? The next element is this idea of will they need additional equipment to max out the value? You buy an Xbox and a controller, you've got to buy a game to go on the Xbox for the Xbox and that controller to be useful. And then you find that actually you could use a headset to go with the controller, and then you could use all the things, all the additional things you need to unlock a value. For this subject, I'm aware that you will need, you'll probably pick up additional items, you'll definitely pick up additional accounts of various services, you will need additional equipment, artifacts and items to get value. And one of those things will be I'm endorsing and suggesting the use of a bullet journal. Why a bullet journal? Well, it's going to come back in strategy, but it's an additional asset needed to get the most value. You don't need it to get basic value, but if you want extended value. Now the other challenge here is the question about the value and use of, is the product consumed at once? Storable, divisible? Look, I may have pre-recorded 14 weeks worth of content, but I'm drip feeding one aspect of the course because the value, the maximum value is when it's divided and experienced over time. The maximum workplace value for your work integrated learning, social media is a duration. It's a thing that you do over time. It's not something that you can just go and run like a Netflix marathon. This is why we have a scheduled Wednesday release rather than everything up and ready to go now. If I allowed a Netflix binge model, I wouldn't be giving you the best benefit you could get. I would actually be harming your work integrated learning opportunities and I'm not about that. So it can't be consumed all at once. Other aspects of this course, yes it can. All of these content videos are up and available for you so you can go down the whole length of the semester, take out first weekend of week one, you can watch everything. All the content, all the pre-recorded content. But the behaviours and the activities, they are spread out so that you train over time. All right, so the second type of value you can get is value in exchange. And this is the worth of an object being what you can get for it in a transaction. This covers business to business. This covers going out op shopping to resell things on eBay. This covers buying something to use as a gift, maybe buying something to use as barter. It's all about what can I get from this in a transactional exchange with someone else. It's not about what I can do with it. It's about what I can get for it. Connected to this, but separate. So use requires ownership. Exchange requires temporary ownership. But ownership, the value in ownership is the idea of owning something for its sake, and the value is not the knowledge of possession. So if you are a collector, if you are a hoarder, a stockpiler, uh, if you buy something to have a redundant copy of it. Now, I'm freely going to admit I have multiple cameras, I have multiple webcams, I have a number of pieces of equipment that probably will never get used because their purpose is to be in a reserve stockpile in the event of the primary equipment breaking, I know I can immediately go for my backup gear. This creates value for me because I reduce my risk. I reduce my perceived risk. I can engage in activities. I can go, oh, I'm going to record all my videos now, knowing I've got three cameras. So if the first one collapses, I've got a second one I can just switch straight to. That is the value in ownership. Also, value in ownership enables locus of control. I stockpile certain items to know that I have those items to enable me to feel a level of control to reduce a risk. 
Others stockpile to, again, exert control and uncertainty. So you'll find this value and ownership is less common in the literature. It's more of one of my frameworks and opinions. But functionally, it's out there and it's a thing that we do. Now, the metrics. We are going to ask you to use metrics this semester. In your technology analysis, you're going to set yourself a goal, a couple of goals, and those goals will have metrics. In your performance review, you're going to evaluate how well your project met those metrics. It's a case of you're going to create a plan, you're going to implement it, and then you're going to measure what happened at the end. But also, metrics are super useful. Marketing is fundamentally an experiment. All of marketing activity is experimental. We release a product, that's an experiment to see if the market buys it. We change the price, it's an experiment. We are the if this then that discipline. But you only know then that if you measure it and write it down. So the difference between marketing and screwing around is definitely writing it down. But the other thing about a metric, and a good metric, is a metric helps get you to the goal. What's important to me is that you have a series of metrics as a marketer, and those metrics are divisible and can help you track if you're in progress. Case in point for me in the development of this subject is that I have 18 videos for which I needed to produce the PowerPoint slides, the version of it that you've downloaded from Wattle, the version of the recording you're currently watching, and there's a whole series of subtasks that follow the recording of this video. So I have a map of metrics. I have a whiteboard tracking have I recorded the content, have I created the content, have I then run it through its post-production cycle, which is about six steps, all of those things help me at a glance see how am I tracking towards my goal of having this course ready before the hop, all the videos ready before the launch of the course, before the course goes live on Wattle. I'll know whether I'm on track, approaching my goal, or if I'm off track, because I am keeping a record and a progress rate. Now the other thing to remember is that what gets measured gets done, so what you want done, remember to measure. Metrices will come back into effect when we talk about strategy and we talk about objectives. So, welcome to round one, week one. If you need to reach me, now look, this is a pre-recorded video. I'm very well aware that you could go the entire semester, almost the entire semester, without human contact in an interactive format. If that's what you want to do, good on you, get in there, have fun with it. But if you do want to reach out to me and between, if you can't make it to a live seminar, you've got social media platforms, you can usually find me at Stephen Dan, you've got the email there, you've got a contact capacity on Wattle to either ask a question of me or to book a consultation. But however it goes, Feel free to reach out. If you need stuff clarified, you want to give feedback, or you just want to ask about something I've said during one of the classes you'd like to follow it up on, feel free to reach out. I'm on the other end of the screen, I'm on the other end of the keyboard, and I'm more than happy to hear from you. Because, at this point in time, we are well before semester. I'm sitting in a studio lab that I built, recording videos, talking to you, on the other side of the screen and uh, cheers mates I hope it's going to be a good semester for you and uh, see you in the sequels <laughs>